Welcome to Mountain View. My name is Jody. I am uh, one of the overseers here. I'm also part of the preaching team, and I'm also a lousy golfer. I mean, really, I try to break 100 every time I play, and it's very easy to break 100. I mean, north of 100. And so, like all golfers, I go practice. Now, if you're a golfer, or maybe you've seen golf, you've seen people out on the driving range and they're perfecting their you know backswing and their follow through and and i actually like golf practice for me i found that it's impossible if, if my mind is really cluttered if i'm really busy i found it is impossible if i am standing over a golf ball to think about anything else it's just impossible unless unless you're at the driving range, and you're about to go play a round of golf with your brother, and it's a beautiful desert course, and it's all awesome. But some father has brought his little kids out there. And little kids run around and yelling and screaming, and they're hitting the ball the wrong way and the right way. And then it is impossible to hit a golf ball. See, the whole point about practice is we're trying to become something else. We become what we practice, right? But we can't practice if there's a lot of noise. Noise hinders practice. We have to get that noise out of the way so we can truly focus and practice and become something better and something different. So here we are finishing up this series on soul detox. And we've talked a lot about all the noises that come into our lives, right? All the noise that we get from media and social media and all the noise that runs in our head and the noise of busyness. And today we're going to talk a little bit about the noise of work. I mean, our own jobs and our own work can create a whole lot of noise in our lives that distracts us and keeps us from doing practices. And if you want to be a good golfer, you got to go out and practice. Well, those of us that are Christians, we want to become more like Jesus, so we need practice. We need spiritual practices. We need practices that help us become more like Jesus. That's called being a disciple. Now, the big buzzword going around, I think, for about the last five years about spiritual disciplines, big buzzword now is uh, spiritual formation. I'm actually working on my master's degree in Christian formation so that I can become not the best Jody. Nobody wants self-actualization of Jody. I want to become more like Jesus. I want to become more like Jesus because that's what he said to do. Follow me. Watch me. See how I do it. So we need these spiritual formation practices. I want to bring up this verse from Paul. This is from Romans chapter 12. He says, Do not conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Check this out. Whether you like it or not, Paul is telling us we are being formed. Whether deliberate, intentional, or accidental, we are being formed. We are either being conformed to the patterns of this world or we deliberately choose to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. There, there's, some, there's some implications to this verse. Formation practices, spiritual practices, inherently are countercultural. Oh, that appeals to my inner hippie. Spiritual formation practices inherently are countercultural. Spiritual formation practices, they're really acts of resistance. They're acts of resistance. They should make you look different than the world, and they should make you look like a nonconformist. Any nonconformists in the room? God endorses it. And the other thing it says is Christ-likeness is possible, but it ain't easy. It's not easy. Because we've, over the last five weeks, we've seen all the noise that hinders us from practice and getting that swing just right and becoming more like Jesus. So how do we do it? Well, we have to detox, right? That's step one. We got to get all the noise out. We got to detox. Now, we haven't talked about this enough, I don't think, in the last five weeks. Let me tell you, detox is hard. If you've 
ever been through detox, if you've, ever, if you've ever known anybody that's gone through some sort of detox, detox is hard. You feel pain. There's withdrawal. Like, I want that thing back, that substance that was not good for me, that substance that was keeping me from living my best life, even my best spiritual life. And so what do we do when we have those withdrawals? We try to fill them. We, we, we relapse. You guys know this pattern of detox and relapse and detox and relapse. And that's why we call these practices so that we get better. I go out, I swing at slices. I go out, I swing at hooks. Eventually, if I swing, it might go straight down the line where I want to go. And it might then work in real life, in the real game. Detox is hard, but what we need to do then is substitute something. Substitute something for that substance. We need to replenish. We need to endorse. We need to take on new habits. We need to take on new habits. Uh, Dallas Willard has a quote here. Um, if, uh, where, where was it? Grace-filled habits, intentional steps to replace former habits and keeping God before us. And then more recently, probably one of the leaders in uh, contemporary um, spiritual formation practices, John Mark Comer, he's, he's written, you will never work harder for anything in your life than Christ-like character, and nothing else will ever feel like such an unearned gift. This is the paradox. You simply have to experience it for yourself. It's not easy. Detox is not easy. If I asked you in this room, how's your detox experience gone the last five weeks of social media and all the noise? I bet you would tell me it hadn't been easy. We need to move into spiritual formation practices and new habits. And by the way, we're supposed to be like Jesus if we're Christians. Jesus had habits. How did Judas know where to find Jesus? Because it was his habit to go to the garden and pray. Here's my question. If somebody had to find you, where would they know to look? What are the habits? What are the habits you have? So we need to look at spiritual formation practices. And the very first and the very preeminent spiritual formation practice. I mean, there's solitude. There's prayer. There's your daily quiet time. There's meeting in groups. All these things are really, really good, and they're really, really essential. But the preeminent, the very first spiritual formation practice is Sabbath. Sabbath. Well, wait a minute. Wait, you, wait, Seth, you're not taking me back to, you know, like old Jewish times, right? And I, I, you're telling me I can't push the elevator button. and you're So let's just get all that out. Let's talk about what Sabbath means. But before we do that, let's go look at the heart of God, what he meant when he instituted Sabbath, when he created Sabbath, when he gave it to us, and then he commanded it. See, it was a three-step process when you go look in the Old Testament. First, he created Sabbath. We go way, way early, right in the beginning. Genesis chapter 2, verses 2 and 3. And on the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done. Notice, he finishes working on the seventh day. On the seventh day, he finished the work he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it, God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. Look when Sabbath was first created. In the beginning. And he created it. Along with everything else. In a nice orderly fashion. Sabbath is created. Rhythms are established. There is order. Now, we could look at seven in the Bible. I mean, uh, <laughs> we could spend weeks looking at, 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 at the symbolism of seven in the Bible. We've looked at that in our, our men's Bible study. Uh, but what I really want you to see is there is a defined pattern on earth and in the cosmos and even in your blood cells, in the RNA of your body. There is, the, there, there is pattern. There is circadian rhythms in you there are seasons the cosmos operates 
and defined patterns. There is a rhythm. There is a way of life. Look, you come in here, you worship, you listen to music on the radio. What does your mind do? It instantly tries to find the beat and tap along with the song. And if you're a dancer, unless you're a Southern Baptist, you try to dance along with the song. I grew up Southern Baptist, so I'm allowed to tell that joke. That's why we can't dance and we can't find rhythm, because we don't practice. We need to practice. And our innate sense is to find the rhythm. And when we get out of rhythm, we instantly try to get back into it when we're listening to music. So should it be with spiritual things. When we get out of rhythm, it feels awkward. It feels odd until sometimes we are so far out of rhythm and we can't get back in, we just give up dancing altogether. It should not be. It should not be. And this is the principle of Sabbath that God first gave us when he created Sabbath, is that there would be rhythm and there would be order, no jet lag, we would be in our time frame. The second thing that tells us is Yahweh is not a workaholic. God is not a workaholic. He's not fretting on the seventh day about the order of the universe and the world. He set it up to function. So now let's move on to when God gave us the Sabbath. Now, we tend to jump to the Ten Commandments, right? But before the Ten Commandments... While they were still wandering in the desert, that's when God gave the Sabbath. So we got to set the context up here. Remember what the Israelites had been doing in Egypt. They had been working 24-7. They were slaves. Pharaoh kept raising the quotas. He kept raising the bar. You got to make more bricks. You got to make more bricks. And when they tried to take some time off to go celebrate, Pharaoh said, we're not going to have any of that. You got to make more bricks and you got to do it without straw. Work harder, harder, harder. And why? He was trying to build up storehouses to store all of his stuff. That's why they needed the bricks for more storehouses. We kind of do that too. We get locked in this cycle where we think we got to work harder, we got to work harder, we got to get ahead, we got to keep going. We can't take a minute off. If we take a day off, we're not going to have storehouses and we're not going to have provision for our future. So then God raises up Moses. We get all the miracles, the seven miracles, the parting of the Red Sea, and they're in the desert and they want to go back. They want to go back to the way it used to be because then at least. They thought they had provision. Then at least they, they knew where their next meal was coming from, from Pharaoh. We just want to go back to being slaves. So God said, here's what I'm going to do, Moses. What we're going to do is we're going to provide manna. Manna, here's what we're going to do. You're going to collect just what you need every day, a bread-like substance that showed up in the morning. And then on the Saturday, or, or I guess the Friday, because they practice Sabbath on Saturday, you'll collect a double portion but by the way, if you collect too much, it rots. So just get enough. Otherwise, it gets stinky. But then on the seventh day, you'll be able to withdraw from what I provided from, for you on the sixth day. You see the way this works. God is giving the Sabbath, and he's providing the Sabbath. He's providing the ability for them to enjoy the Sabbath. So he says, uh, Exodus 16, And the Lord said to Moses, I will rain down bread from heaven for you. The people are to go out each day and gather enough for that day, and in this way I will test them and see whether they follow my instructions. And on the sixth day they're to prepare what they bring in, and it'll be twice as much as they gathered on the other days. Verse 29. This is before the Ten Commandments. Bear in mind that the Lord has given you the Sabbath. It's a gift. This is why on the sixth day he gives you bread for two days. Everyone is to stay where they are on the seventh day. No one is to go out. And so the people rested on the seventh day. And then he commands the Sabbath. And this is where we get to the Ten Commandments. This is where we get to the Ten Commandments. This is the fourth commandment. 
And it's funny, uh, you know, we all know the great commandment, you know, when Jesus was asked, which we do, he said, love God and love neighbor. And we can look at the Ten Commandments, and the first three are all about love God, honor God, right, no idols before me. And the final six are all about love neighbor. You know, and if we did a poll, yeah, hey, list out the Ten Commandments, we'd easily, we'd say, thou shalt not murder, and, you know, thou shalt not steal, and uh, the adultery one, we'll talk about that, and don't lie. And, and you know what the least remembered command probably would be remember the sabbath and keep it holy remember the sabbath but it's the least remembered command let's look at it remember the sabbath this is exodus chapter 20 by keeping it holy six days you shall labor and do all your work but on the sabbath is a sabbath to the lord your god on it you shall do no work neither you nor your son nor your daughter nor your male or female servant nor your animals nor any foreigner residing in the towns for in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and he rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day, and he makes it holy. Remember and make it holy. What makes the Sabbath holy? God's presence. God blesses the seventh day. God makes it holy. If we try to practice our day off without God, it's not a Sabbath. It's not a Sabbath day. It becomes a selfish day. I'm guilty of this. I'm guilty of looking at my day off as an entitlement. And actually, it is an entitlement. He's saying, Jews, you get to be different than the rest of the world. I'm providing for you so you can take a day off. You can get some rest, and you can be with me. That's the heart. That's the heart. See, it's more than a day off. It's a day with. It's more than a day off. It's a day with. And I've learned it's possible to not work and not keep the Sabbath. Not work and not keep the Sabbath. He is a Sabbath-keeping God we see in this passage in Exodus. He keeps the Sabbath, and he invites us to do it for our benefit. Now, there's one other time in the Old Testament God provides or he talks about the Sabbath. There's actually many times, but one other time right before, this is 40 years later, they're just about finally to go into the promised land. And Moses, he brings out the Ten Commandments again. He says, remember what I told you 40 years ago? Remember the commandments? Let's look at them again. And he makes a slight revision, a slight revision when he's recapping the Sabbath. Again, the fourth commandment, again, the one that gets the most airtime of all the commandments. And he says this, you shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God brought you out up there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. See, in the earlier version, he says, keep the Sabbath because I want you to be like me, a mago day in the image of God. And here he's saying, I want you to remember, I have freed you. You are emancipated. You are no longer a slave. You don't have to be a slave to work. If I had to sum it up in one slide, this, I believe, is the heart of God toward us with Sabbath. Remember, I freed you. Stay free with me. Remember, I freed you. You don't have to work 24-7. You're no longer a slave. You're no longer a slave to sin. I freed you. You don't have to work all the time, despite what the world tells you. You don't have to, whatever your Pharaoh boss is telling you. I'm telling you, remember, I freed you. Stay free with me. Now, what if I, my job schedule makes me work on Sunday, or what if I have to do that? I know. In fact, Paul is going to address that to the early church when there was a big debate on, on Sabbath day observation. We have a big tension in contemporary culture that's frankly not new about observing Sabbath. As I told you, it's the least remembered. And, I mean, the whole world is 24-7. Back then, 
that whole nation, they would all take the day off together. So there was nothing else to do. But now everybody's operating 24-7 and some jobs are required 20. Frankly, if you've ever had a career in IT like me, weekends were created for system upgrades, right? And if you're on church staff, you're working. And so how do we reconcile all this? And it's gone two directions. It's gone hardcore legalism, and then it's gone hardcore, I would say, liberalism. So let's look at legalism. Jesus really confronted this when he walked on the earth some 2,000 years ago. So I took out my Bible app, and I typed Sabbath, and I saw every, every occasion of the word Sabbath. And I looked at the Gospels, the recap, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, of the life of Jesus on earth. And I looked at the word Sabbath. <sighs> this is amazing. Every time Sabbath is mentioned in the Gospels, Jesus is using it to confront the religious leaders. There are nine different stories in the Gospels about Sabbath, recorded five different times. Now, we created a chart for you here. It's a bit of an eyesore. You can try to take a picture of it, but I have great news for you. We have a team here that creates a piece of paper every week called Talk It Overs. And the Talk It Overs has all the verses and it has all the questions. And you can use those to discuss in your family or in your small group. And we've got all these verses and all these passages here. I just want you to see how often Jesus confronted the Pharisees by helping people on the Sabbath. Over and over again, he healed a paralyzed man. He, the disciples one day, they were picking grain on the Sabbath, and they said, how dare you do work? And he said, don't you remember when David went in and he ate the showbread? I mean, and you kind of revere David. So, And by the way, the priests, you know, they're working on the Sabbath day, so are they in violation? Right. It, they were so tripped up in doing the Sabbath for God rather than realizing the Sabbath was for themselves. He healed a man with a shriveled hand. He healed a disabled woman on the Sabbath. Uh, another man who had dropsy. By the way, these are in the order of appearance, uh, chrono in, in chronological order. Here's the summary. Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath. If you can go to the next slide, Jesus is the Lord of the Sabbath. And in that, if we're going to be like Jesus, we should probably observe Sabbath the way Jesus did. The second thing, he says Sabbath is made for man. It's funny, God didn't sit around, and it doesn't say in the creation narrative, and on the sixth day, God created a bunch of rules. And then he made man to adhere to the rules. The heart of God for all those commandments is so that we'd be happy, not to restrict our freedom, but so that we would keep our freedom. If we don't kill one another, if we don't cheat on one another, if we don't lie to one another, if we honor God, we will be happier. The whole goal is to be happy. So the goal of the Sabbath is to increase your happiness and your joy with the Lord. But it requires trust. It requires that God will provide for us. And then the final thing is, it is absolutely 100% okay to do good on the Sabbath. If Mary calls you and says, I really need help moving, and you've got a pickup truck, would it be loving your neighbor to say, oh, I'm sorry, you know, it's Sabbath? No! And God doesn't give us commands that are in violation with one another. Love God, love neighbor. The other day, I was observing my Sabbath this week on a Monday because I had been really busy on a Sunday. And the way I observe Sabbath, I take my watch off. I make the commitments to make no commitments. That's my, my I uh, do some reading, but I don't do anything for profit. I have a consulting business, and I just don't allow meetings to be scheduled on my Sabbath day. I book it in my calendar. If somebody calls up and says, hey, can we, I'm, say, I'm sorry, I'm busy. It's that simple. So last Monday, two Mondays ago, um, I get a call from a company I work with, and they asked me if I could drop in on a meeting. And it would have been about two hours, and frankly, it would have been two good billable hours. Uh, my client is calling. I think I should do this. And I wrestled with it, and I talked with Bernice. And then I also had a good friend who called and said, Jody, I have to submit a job application tomorrow. Can you please review my cover letter? Eh. I decided not to take the meeting. 
I decided to help my friend with this cover letter. And so I think I was keeping with the principles of Sabbath. And by the way, shortly after I made that decision not to keep the meeting, the meeting got canceled. <laughs> Come on, the Lord works in great ways. But the other way this works sometimes is license. And I get it. It's probably running through your mind right now. Jody, are you telling me I have to take a full 24? Are you telling me it needs to be? I'm not telling you anything. I'm not telling you Saturday or Sunday or Friday. I'm not telling you. I'm just showing you God's heart of Sabbath. But Paul, Paul gives us two verses in the New Testament. As the early church was starting, he wrote to two of his churches, one in Colossae and the other in Rome. And there was a lot of debate on the Sabbath. Should it be Saturday or Sunday? Uh, and the first one to Colossians, he said, Therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food or drink or in regard to a festival, a new moon, or the Sabbath. See, then the debate was, should Sabbath be on Saturday or Sunday? And then in Romans, Paul says, One person esteems one day better than another, and another esteems all days alike. Everyone should be fully convinced in their own minds. But whatever you do, do it in honor of the Lord. In your own mind, in my mind, is a dangerous place. Frankly, I can rationalize and justify a lot of things. But I'm not sure I've always been fully convinced in my mind the way I've been observing Sabbath. Now, growing up with our children, we made it a principle to make church a priority. We didn't enlist in any sports or anything like that that was deliberately going to take us away from Sunday. However, we did do a lot of outdoor activities and camping and, and all that. I think we did a pretty good job of adhering to the Sabbath principle. Not always. Frankly, there were times I left church and I opened my laptop right away to get to work. I, I'm not putting myself as a model. I'm showing myself as somebody who also has struggled with what this really means in our lifetimes and what it means. If we want to look at somebody who's managed the tension of Sabbath really well in contemporary culture, there's a guy named Truett. You may have heard of Truett. Truett opened a restaurant. It was a diner. It was a small diner. Uh, it was 24-7 a day, 24-7. Um, and it was called the Dwarf Grill. And the Dwarf Grill, he invented in 1946 a brand new sandwich. It was uh, take the bone out of the chicken, take the skin off the chicken, deep fry it, add a couple pickles to it, and you know what you get? Chick-fil-A sandwich. Chick-fil-A sandwich. And he decided with that very first restaurant, they were not going to work on the Sabbath because he wanted to teach Sunday school. And he stuck to his principles, and he built a culture on that. I have a very good friend who works at Chick-fil-A corporate. He's a coach. Uh, if a Chick-fil-A store uh, maybe isn't you know, meeting their standards or having some issues, they send him and his team in to help the owner-operator and the team become even better. The Chick-fil-A philosophy is, we want this to be the last job you ever take. It's an amazing organization. And I was talking with Mark about Chick-fil-A, who, by the way, Chick-fil-A is now $22 billion in revenue. $22 billion in revenue. Many times people have come to Chick-fil-A and said, you should go public. And they said no, because they know if they take the company public, there will be enormous pressure for them to open on Sundays. Because if you just do the simple algebra, that would immediately add at least $4 billion to the bottom line. Because they're taking nearly 14% of their opportunity off the table. But God's economy and God's algebra does not work like that. Frankly, I think if they opened on Sunday and Mark agrees, they might gain a little bit of income and revenue, but they would lose their culture, they would lose their way, and they would probably backtrack. It's possible... Here's what Truett said. The question for me is how do we balance the pursuit of profit and personal character 
that is our culture. For me, I find balance by applying biblical principles. I see no conflict between biblical principles and good business practices. In fact, Mark told me, the only time Chick-fil-A opens on a Sunday, and they willingly do it, is if they're responding to a catastrophe or natural disaster and people need to be fed. The only time they break their Sabbath is to help others. Doesn't that feel and sound a lot like Jesus? Now, I hope to do more than just make you hungry and go to Chick-fil-A tomorrow. Let's bring this all home. And like they teach you at preaching school, let's put up, you know, four or five words all beginning with the same letter. Here's how I think in studying all this and analyzing all this for today, for our contemporary culture. Here are some guidelines I would give you, I would suggest to you to discuss and pray about in observing Sabbath as a Christian in this time, in this place. First, it's practice it's practice. We get better with practice. You may say, ah, this is hard. Every time I try to take a step, my kids go nuts or uh, the job calls or whatever. It's practice. We will get better. But we won't become more like Jesus unless we practice. It's practice. Second, pray. Jody, you don't know my schedule. And I mean, I am so, and I, my calendar is so full. And you have I get it. I get it. Pray like David who said, search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. Because, man, this idea of taking a whole day off, that makes me, gives me anxiety. See if there is any offensive way in me, like Jody observing selfish day rather than Sabbath day, and lead me in the way everlasting. Just pray that. And let the Spirit give you guidance. Keep perspective. Sabbath is a liberating gift. We were slaves. We don't have to be slaves again. Let's not go back to Egypt. It's a gift. Presence. It's God's presence that makes the Sabbath holy. And it's also communion. You saw that in Exodus. Nobody's supposed to work. Your sons, your daughters, your male servant, your female servant, not even the animals. How can you incorporate your loved ones into your Sabbath practice? How can you keep that presence? And then finally, plan. I've got an illustration here. Uh, I'm going to borrow from Stephen Covey. Um, I first saw this years and years ago. We've got a lot going on in our lives. We've got so many things that fill up our calendar. These, these are some of those things. Maybe this is, I don't know, a little bit of sleep. And then we got family. We got the kids. We got Little League. God help us. We've got um, jobs. And then, uh, oh, yeah, you want me to volunteer for that thing? And then uh, I need to eat. And, well, wait a minute, social media. You know, I got I to gotta spend all that time. And so maybe you haven't booked all your time. Maybe you've got some capacity in your seven days, in your 168 hours that you get every week. And then somebody like me stands up here and says, we want you to take this big rock called Sabbath, San Onofre's finest gold rock, and we want you to add that to your life. It won't fit. It's impossible, unless instead of cramming Sabbath into your life, if you take Sabbath and you prioritize it and you put it into your calendar first, everything else will fit. Everything else will fit. Your calendar may be so busy and so crazy right now, 
you can't schedule a Sabbath day for months. Schedule it today and start practicing. Normally, I would end here, or a speaker like me, and we would end here, and then uh, we would cut it off, and there would be a song. But today, we're going to let Courtney and the band finish this message. See, we get together, and we work on our drafts and our scripts and all that. We, the whole Sunday is planned out, and every song is coordinated, but Kaimana found an absolutely perfect song that I think perfectly communicates the heart of God on Sabbath. He doesn't want something from you. He wants something for you. And he knows you're tired. He knows you're exhausted. He wants you to have rest. So for the next three and a half minutes, in community, together, we're going to practice Sabbath with God. Maybe you grab the hand of the person with you. Maybe you just close your eyes. It's a new song. Maybe you just observed the words. But would you please receive this is a blessing and an experience of Sabbath rest, of what God wants you to experience with him.
Let you see. 